and I think we are good to go. So welcome everybody to our sixth meeting of our growth management public outreach process. Um, just a real quick to begin, as most of you are now familiar with, I'm just gonna give a quick rundown of where you can find everything. Uh, my name is Zach Hendricks. I am the climate action and long range planning um, administrative assistant for Pickens County Community Development. We have Ellen Sasano, who is our long range planner and Cindy Cuban, who is our community development director with you today. If you go to our Pickens County website up at the top, um, sorry, if you go to a website, scroll down a little bit, you'll see the planning zoning building button. If you click on that, that'll take you to the community development page. In the middle is our growth management public outreach information button. If you click on that, that'll take you to our website that has all of our information on it. Some brief descriptions of what the process is, dates, a link to join and also how to get to the YouTube. We have citizen input that we've received as well as a link to our YouTube channel where all of these meetings are being taken to. There are also direct links here that you can access all of the previous meetings with as well. And then under each chat tab are, is key information relating to that topic. I have not yet added the tables that were sent out to you in the email list but I will get those up um, either later today or tomorrow. So those will be accessible as well if you did not receive them. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Cindy really quickly. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I see a couple new folks who um, are familiar to the uh, public process and thank you for being here. If you haven't had a chance already, please go back and review what you can of our previous meetings, because I think there's some really good information there um, that you may um, want to help inform your thoughts um, as we go forward. As Zach said, it's meeting six, and this is a nine meeting series. I can't believe we're here already. And we've had some great discussions. So we feel that we're at a point, our last meeting, sort of teed up this meeting to allow us to now start talking about house size. We talked about land use patterns or growth patterns, if you will, last time. There was a lot of discussion about what was appropriate in an urban growth boundary setting. Some people liked the concept of having nodes along the highway for additional, in my mind, I think it was addressed more additionally towards affordable housing, not just any development, but more transit oriented development. Um, so we've had some good discussions and we started talking about the land use pattern and how the code is set up in a way that uh, preserving the, the most rural areas in rural and remote um, works with a system of transferable development rights and how that works and then how that works in our growth management system to um, then set up our competition or exemptions for uh, allowing someone to compete for square footage or to be able to purchase square footage um, through a transferable development rights program and how all that just intricately fits together. I know there's a lot of questions probably still because we have gone through somewhat of a crash course on growth management and the land use code over the last six weeks, but hopefully you've got a good sense of it um, if you haven't been in these public outreach processes before, um, please reach out and we're, we're happy to um, bring you up to speed wherever we can, as always. We've sent out some information today and the whole purpose of today is really to have you um, talk, um, to have you be the people who inform us about your thoughts relative to um, house size. We've, we've looked at the land use patterns, now we're looking at house size. And in our earlier discussions um, and throughout the, the six meetings, we've emphasized the board's mission statement, which is basically to look, um, to have a robust community looking through the climate action lens and looking through our economy lens. So it's all a blend and um, there's a lot to think about, but as we move forward, we'd like to hear from you because we feel like we've culminated a lot of the information. We pulled together a lot of the information in the charts that Zach 
sent out earlier this week. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at those and we can just pull those up on the screen and start talking. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to put in one place the thoughts that we've had so far about um, how size, well, about impacts. And then because this meeting is discussing how size, we related it to square footage and we related it on a basis. Um, you can see on the right-hand side of one chart, we talk about the national average, the county average sizes, um, and, and look, look elsewhere at statistics where the chart really does focus more on us and what we're doing. So quickly, you know, we looked at the caucus areas and what their square footage limitations are today in the land use code, um, put that chart together, looked at municipal boundaries in Pitkin County and what those look like as far as um, square footages. And then um, the Pitkin County Rural and Remote Zone District, which is the hundred, excuse me, the thousand square feet along with the um, seldom heard about and seldom seen uh, transitional residential one and two, which are located on Smuggler Mountain and the front side of Aspen Mountain. And we can get into that a little bit um, if you like, but um, there we have it. We have an average house size in Pitkin County um, of about 3,300 square feet, um, but the average house size over the last 10 years has gone up in terms of our building permits to just over 5,000 square feet. And um, we are looking at homes in Pitkin County taking um, upwards of three years and we're thinking even more in some of the homes that we have uh, permitted today to build. And so the, the impacts that come along with construction to a neighborhood over a you know three to five year period for the, some of the larger homes um, has come up as an issue. Um, and then just to give us some balance, uh, the average size home in the United States is around 2,600 square feet. So um, Zach with the next, I think the next chart is the one that really is um, gonna be of interest in some discussion today. And then I'm gonna turn it over to the group for just jumping into our discussion. As you can see on the left-hand side, we've identified house sizes and we did that in increments of our transferable development rights just to have something to base it off of. Um, 2,500 square feet per development right, 5,750. That second number is our exemption from growth management for which anyone um, may uh, develop without going through growth management. We put the average house size um, at the top, the average Picking County house size, just to give a sense of that. And we've talked a little bit about climate action and how it relates to um, replacement of these homes. Um, so you have a 3,200 square foot house in Emma or a 3,200 square foot house anywhere in the county. I'm just making it up. Um, Woody Creek or uh, Snowmass. That house today uh, could be replaced up to the 5750 and be exempt from growth management um, just to set the stage for where we are. And we started talking about replacement square footage and what that looked like relative to impacts. Um, as far as the climate action lens of what we're doing, we had done some earlier studies with the annual energy use per square footage um, the next column over shows you the percentage jump between each one of the square footages. Um, pretty cool little mark there. <laughs> and then... Um, Just to clarify, the percentage is the jump from 3250. So that 341 is more than that. So these are all baselined on this top column. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. And then the waste generated um, in construction, Zach, that's the same jump from the 3250 um, to the 15,000. Um, then the average number of jobs added after construction to a home. We just recently did an update to our transportation, excuse me, our, yeah, our transportation impact fee and um, have some updated numbers there as well as numbers that we've gotten through the employee um, generation numbers that we've done through the years. 
and this shows um, the number of employees post construction does not include the construction phase of employment uh, for employment. And then of course the average daily vehicle trips um, and what that looks like based on um, normal usage of one of these square footages of homes. So we've got all that data for you to kick off this conversation. And if Ellen or Zach don't have anything else to add, I'd really like to turn it over to the group um, for your discussion. Um, I, I just want to caveat yeah. this whole with, obviously there's going to be outliers, like one house is not going to be the same as another one. These are just baseline averages from previous studies that have been done in Picking County. Um, they're not verbatim. We just wanted to give you some data to frame the questions around. And then I was just going to ask Zach to clarify. I think the, the column on the far right is vehicle miles traveled. Is that right, Zach? Rather yeah, it's vehicle miles traveled that are added by that development. Thank you. Looks like Suzanne has her hand up. Yeah, uh, going back to that last chart, um, uh, where we, we can, can you quickly do, or can one of you quickly do, to double check my numbers, under the house size column, how, what's the percentage larger, square, square footage larger from 3250 to 5750? My calculations, which are usually poor, say that that's 77% larger. 3250 is 5750 is 30 is 77 percent larger than 3250. And then 8250 is 154 percent larger than 5750. Could you could one of you quickly do those? Um, because, because I think it would it, pretend I'm correct about 5750 being 77 percent larger in square footage than 3250. Um, then we can say it's 72 percent more, 77 percent more square feet, but it produces. One hundred and thirty one point five percent more energy use. And I think it would be helpful to be able to compare those percentage wise. Yeah, so you're right on the first one, 82, the jump from 5750 to 8250 is 43%. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that a good way to look at it is if you knock off this first number on the column, that's pretty close for these first three. And then, so this would be a 20% jump on that one. Um, I have to do the last two, but so that's, it's roughly a 43% here. Um, it's a 77% jump there. And that's about a 20% jump, um, but I have to do all the, I have to do all the math um, right now. Okay, repeat that once more. How much law, the percentage in terms of square feet between 3250 and 5750 is what? So, from 3250 to 5750, you're correct, that's 77%. The jump okay. from 5750 to 8250 is 43%. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to do the other ones real quick. Um, but okay. if you give me a second, I can get that up for you. Okay, thank you. That would, I think that's another good comparison to have on hand. Some of the people who were in our last public outreach relative to energy and, um, and uh, waste, we've looked at a lot of that since then. Our codes now look at um, an energy budget, if you will, and um, there are some new landfill regulations relative to, um, to waste that have addressed some of that. So anybody from that group want to jump in? Because we know that some of this was discussed in that group as well. And we were just waiting to get it all ready for this discussion. 
the main questions we'd like to try to address today are right here on the screen. Um, you know, it's just some of the basic questions. You know, are the 15,000 square foot homes all right in Pickens County? If not, what would the largest house size be? If larger homes are okay, where should they be located? And what is the normal house size that we are all right with seeing being built? Currently, it is the 5750 feet. And how do we look at house size through the climate action lens? Yeah. I think that fifth question is um, something we want to ask in each one of these questions. Hi, Cindy. This is Phi. And one of the questions that comes to my mind, you're looking at this table, and thank you so much for doing these. These are really powerful. You know, looking at the emissions and the amount of waste that's generated, um, which are obviously things that with the, with the county's goals are very hard to justify, I think. What, are there any um, upsides to 15,000 square foot homes? or larger? I mean, what, 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 what are the benefits that they bring to the community? Or do they, you know, I mean, cause I, some of these are really, even if they can, you know, pay for their emissions, I don't know that that, you know, in the big picture of climate, of climate action, that that, you know, makes a huge difference um, or in terms of our landfill filling up, so. Thanks for that question. I'll let everybody else jump in on that. There was a question um, by Mona Newton that I saw asking whether or not it's for the county to limit house size. And definitely that's what zoning is all about. Dimensional standards um, are um, power that's under our zoning provisions. Before the 15,000 square foot limitation, there was no limitation um, on the larger parcels. Um, as you get closer to town, where the lots are traditionally smaller, there's what's called the floor area ratio between the lot and house size. And um, typically <clears throat> those, those homes are smaller because there's a limitation based on whatever the lot size is. Also, just by way of background, what, giving Zach a chance to work through numbers, for that first question, are 15,000 square foot homes all right in Pickham County? As Cindy discussed uh, right off the bat, as part of master plan, some of the caucuses have weighed in on this question. And there are some caucus areas like the Owl Creek area, um, Brush Creek, Woody Creek, east of Aspen areas that said, you know what? Yeah, large homes are, are okay here. They, they fit in with our character at least. And there are other caucus areas that ask the Board of County Commissioners to reduce that 15,000 square foot cap uh, in their air areas because primarily because they really didn't fit in terms of rural character or the character of, of their caucus areas. And those, those caucuses um, include uh, the Snowmass Capital Creek Caucus and the Frying Pan Caucus area. You know, most of the homes up there are quite small and they wanted to maintain that, that character. Um, the Maroon Creek Caucus recently has come in and, and requested a 5,750 square foot cap in their, within their caucus area. And let's see, what am I missing? Uh, Anyway, the point being that caucuses have weighed in, um, not all of them, but several of them on this particular topic, as it relates primarily to, to, to the character of their neighborhoods, um, maybe not looking quite as closely at some of the nuances that we have in this second chart that Zach is up for us. And the TDR does require a special review, except in certain areas, where the board has determined that those areas are acceptable um, for the receiving of TDRs without a special review. And those neighborhoods, Ellen, you may need to help me, but I know they include Starwood, and I just saw Mark's hand up or something, 
And then um, they also include, I believe, east of Aspen. Um, I'm not sure. Ellen can help me with the locations. Or Zach or Ellen. Ellen, you're muted. And then I'm going to show. Ellen, you're muted. There, now I'm not. You can hear me now. Thanks. So those neighborhoods include Starwood, Owl Creek Ranch, Eagle Pine Subdivision, Castle Creek Valley Ranch, White Star Ranch, and Aspen Valley Downs. And there are a few other subdivisions, but those were subdivisions that exist where there are large homes already. And the Board of County Commissioners thought that landing TDRs without a special review to consider neighborhood impacts um, <clears throat> worked because there were already, those were considered to be, for lack of a better term, um, large home zones um, to begin with. So special review didn't really, um, didn't seem necessary. And as, as a result, um, it's not necessary uh, for landing a TDR in those specific areas. So, so Oh, sorry. Can I, hi, this is Mona. I think somebody else actually had their hand up though. Yeah, Chris, I was about to call on him. I just wanted to explain on um, the numbers you see here. So this is the percent of square footage larger than 3,250. So 5,750 is 77% larger than this. 8,250 is 150% larger than this. So that's what these here are. And then this is how much larger 8,250 is than 5,750 and 1070 is bigger than that. So that's what the different percentages are there are, but that's there for you. And then um, Chris, you had your hand up, so please feel free to make a comment. Hi, thanks guys. Um, I, I joined a few minutes late, sorry about that. I saw that you had a, a question five up about, you know, um, how people are viewing large house sizes in the context of climate action and was wondering if um, you'd received any comments and if you could just kind of like summarize and recap those because um, I had one thought but uh, didn't want to be redundant. Don't think we've gotten any comments quite yet in this group from it. Um, we're really hoping that um, if anybody has anything to say on any of the questions that we posted, please feel free to speak up and provide your comments now. And let me just say it's kind of hard to keep up with the chat and the um and what's going on on the screen so please um speak up if you can um we'll try to capture the chats and come back to those but um but please speak up john Dahl agrees with gail and gail's comment was um basically that if we if there aren't any good reasons for large homes and we're trying to be consistent with the other values that we talked about earlier. It would be consistent to limit house size based on uh, environmental reasons outlined in this chart. Um, <clears throat> question. Can I, hi, this is Mona. Can I talk or, I mean, I'm, I don't seem to have the little hand on my screen, so I'm not sure. Please go for it. Um, Thanks. So it just kind of in summary, it sounds like there, um, like there are, uh, there's a total of six caucuses. Is that correct? Um, about 11. Oh, 11. Okay. Sorry. 11, so you, yeah. you went through, I mean, um, uh, Ellen went through a list of those that have limited them. And so, um, and those that haven't limited. So like if you kind of summarize that, would you say that 50% in 50% of the county where you can build house sizes limited or in 60, you know, is there any way? And then, cause it feels like then that's kind of what we're dealing with is the, the rest of this, um, the rest of this, that where the, the caucuses haven't taken any um, initiative to reduce house size. I mean, I think from a climate perspective, I mean, um, if I asked a good question, you know, in the grand scheme of things, but I, I think in the grand scheme of things, when we did the um, analysis, the emissions inventory, and we'll be updating it again, but I mean, if, you know, the largest portion 
of emissions come from buildings and the majority of the buildings are residences. There's some, there's a correlation here between emissions and size inherently in my mind, I guess I'm kind of making a jump here. Um, and so it seems that following some trends and somebody just pointed out that the national family house size is actually declining and um, Pitkin County has been a leader. I mean, it, it does feel like there's an opportunity to start trying to tilt back towards the other direction. The other direction being smaller is beautiful. I think that's the phrase that a book that I read in college anyway. So smaller is beautiful and that we should start sort of leaning towards that. I mean, because uh, while we're moving towards net zero on the energy side, just the amount of resource consumption required in building a larger home is uh, pretty extensive. So it, I don't know, I mean, how you want to, how the, uh, if you expect to steer the conversation today or want to steer the conversation, but it does feel like starting to steer the, the, the house size towards a smaller footprint because of the other factors that we've been talking about in terms of emissions and character and livability that we want to try to retain. And then the other numbers that have been brought up um, lately about the numbers of people coming into the county and potentially staying permanently, that feels like we've got a lot of variables here that start pointing us in a direction to try to start to reduce our overall impact in Pitkin County. And that's one piece of it. House size. Susan, I see you have your hand up, but real quick, Mark Knoll had reached out to me before you put it up. So Mark, please feel free to jump in. Hi, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, Hi. great. Um, Mark Knoll here. I'm the Starwood Architectural Advisor. I've been attending these meetings. Want to say thanks so much to the staff and all of your hard work. And I did go through and I believe Zach put together some of these graphics and they've been very helpful in outlining kind of what the overall condition is. I represent the homeowners and the HOA for Starwood. And we have historically been a TDR receivership site uh, in Pitkin County. Um, with the graphic that's up on the screen right now, we have houses in Starwood that range from, I think there might even still be a couple older, smaller houses that range from the 3,000 square feet up to the 15,000 square feet. And I know it is the, you know, it, it works with our neighborhood. Um, it, the houses, the lots are generally larger and it is a place where some of those bigger places, bigger houses can take place. And we would like to maintain our status of being a TDR receivership site and continue to be able to expand to larger houses uh, where, you know, the, the lot uh, can can put a house there and we think it works with our neighborhood. Uh, our last two houses that were being that are being built in Starwood uh, are right around the 5750 mark. So you know I think there's some responsible development that's going on there, but there's also a, a place as far as Starwood is concerned to um, put some larger homes in. Thank you. Mark, would you want to address the question that came up of what benefits there might be from having larger homes in the community? Well, you know, I, th I think there, there's a couple of different answers from my perspective with that. You know, our neighborhood uh, kind of attracts that because we have some larger uh, lot sizes and, you know, other than saying that, you know, the kind of that, if you build it, they will come it, you know, that's where people have been developing houses of this size. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're going to do them here or they're going to find somewhere else to do them. And I know that's not necessarily the best answer, but I think that's kind of part of what it is. Um, it has to do with, from my perspective, a certain level of the ability to build a larger house. And um, I'm not sure that I can answer it beyond that. 
Thanks. Um, Susan, I see you have your hand up. Please feel free to jump in. You're talk are you talking to me, Suzanne? Susan. Yes. Susan Welch. Oh, I'm sorry. Susan. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, I have to agree with Mark on that. I, I don't mind the house sizes, as long as the impact on the neighborhood is not affected, uh, or the sight lines and the setbacks, all these things have to be taken into consideration. The one thing that you said, is there anything good about a 15,000 square foot house or even smaller than that? Uh, usually that particular house has um, somebody who owns it doesn't live here. And, and that, that would be a second homeowner. So half the time that house isn't even used. And so as far as the impact, if you took 15,000 square feet and you put in several units, uh, it'd be probably used more often than one house that's 15,000 square feet. Um, I do think it's, you have to take into consideration uh, the size of the property and where it's located. And um, I happen to have lived in an area that every house was larger than 5,750 feet. And hardly anybody was ever there. I was the only full-time resident. So as far as the impact on the, on the city itself, uh, <laughs> there really wasn't a lot of impact. Uh, so that's one thing that now in, in New Zealand, uh, I know I mentioned that our sister city is Queenstown and Queenstown won't allow any house now to be built that can be seen from a road. So if you're coming into Queenstown on the main road, you're not allowed to build anything that can be seen. So a lot of it depends on, remember Prince Bandar's house? What was that? 43,000 square feet or something. No one ever saw it unless you're in an airplane. Uh, but he certainly did a lot for the city of Aspen. I can't think of anybody who didn't do more for the city of Aspen. So I do like the idea of TDRs. I think it's important to keep our house sizes down if we can. But if there's one that uh, somebody really wants to, to build a, a, a large home, I, I think when you start saying that it's such a, a, a terrible thing for, the, for energy, well, I just know that a lot of these houses aren't even used um, uh, most of the time. So anyway, that's my two cents worth. Thank you. Thank you. So just one comment there. Our understanding about occupancy as it relates to energy use, and this, the and or Mona may have more to add to this, but you would think that less occupancy would equate to less energy use, but some of these larger homes are so complex um, that they need to be running 24 seven, regardless of whether they're occupied or not. So it's an interesting concept, um, but I think there, there are some things to consider there. I do wanna add that the study that was done is um, it doesn't, um, take into account how many days of the year a home is used. These are just raw numbers taken from our energy providers. And um, therefore, um, some of the larger homes, you may assume people aren't there full time, um, but the energy use is quite a bit higher. And what we thought in some cases is, is because of a lot of the amenities um, that go along with the home um, of that size. Um, so just another bit of information. Did well, what, what, oh, I'm probably, am I still muted? No, you're good. Okay, um, I, I did live in an area and there were, there were two homes out of 17 that had um, energy that was going on because they had artwork, but the rest of the people just turned everything off. And so it depends on the homeowner, I believe. 
And the other thing is one nice thing about having one large lot with a, a larger home, that's less density. So as far as keeping the population down, um, to me that I, I like the idea of not having quite as, as large a city, if you might say. So I'm not pushing for larger homes, but I'm not that against them. If they have the if they have an acreage and you don't have to look at them, and so that's what I'm getting at. One of the things that that comes to mind is our conversation about limitations versus mitigation. So just keep that in mind. If you feel like one of the mitigating factors is larger lots, um, you may just want to start a column thinking about that. Okay. Chris, you have your hand up again. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, just a, a comment or two on this one, and then um, a question. Um, really, you know, appreciate um, Mark and Susan's kind of perspective and, and input on this. Um, and had a, a follow up question for for Mark. Just you know, since you're kind of in the know and in this area, um, and the question is, uh, you know, do you feel as though if there were home size restrictions, um, folks that wanted to build, you know, very large homes, like actually would go elsewhere. In other words, is it the ability to build big or is it, you know, the location um, that is attracting people to the area? Um, so question, just a question I, I'd love to hear your perspective on. Um, in terms of just thoughts on you know, kind of the question five you guys had put up, Zach, like how do we look at this through a climate lens? Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I saw the original presentation on resource consumption um, by house size when the data came out. And one thing that really struck me was the fact that, um, you know, resource consumption really goes up uh, exponentially um, by square footage. And I know that this isn't based on occupancy, you know, as Cindy mentioned, um, what I interpreted from that report um, was that it's simply based on, you know, kind of the, um, all the stuff going on in, in the larger homes, um, uh, kind of from, a, you know, equip, like, I don't know, equipment, um, et cetera, that is in the larger homes. Um, so to me, you know, kind of where it, <laughs> it puts my mind is that this is one of those areas where, you know, it's a unique to, to kind of pick in County. Um, I don't know if, I don't think clash of values is the right word, but kind of like interesting intersection of values, kind of like Skiko and the airport, right? They're a climate leader, um, but they also, you know, can say like, well, we rationalize the airport because it's our, our bread and butter and that's what makes this place, this place. Um, and to me, there's like, you know, there's like no easy answer to this one. Um, <laughs> so that's where, that's where it leaves me um, is, you know, like I know this is an, an industry here and um, it's uniquely kind of picked in county and we also wanna be a climate leader so I think it's, it's important to, you know, continue exploring and, um, you know, kind of get a lot of input and perspective on um, and also think through, you know, kind of like the two approaches that Cindy was mentioning, um, you know, direct, I guess, like direct uh, restriction versus um, mitigation. So real quick, I just want to respond to Kim's chat um, question. Um, so these energy, so we did a, a study with resource energy uh, engineering group with August Haas. Um, and so these numbers are averages over four years for a broad array of houses. So you would have captured houses that were not being occupied for half the year. You would have captured full residency occupancy. Um, and then they averaged them out. So this number is an average for all of those houses in that category that they took samples from. Um, the one other thing, um, just a quick, I don't mean to correct you too much, Chris, but um, the exponential one was actually only shown from a preliminary study. When they got more samples, it's actually 
steady. So you do see greater energy use for greater house size, but it's not like an exponential goes off the chart. It's pretty consistent. The larger the house, the more energy it uses per square footage, but it doesn't start increasing dramatically at a particular square footage. Um, and then I'd like to give Mark a chance to respond to Chris's question. Um, Chris, I think you brought up a lot of good points. This is Mark. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of challenges in this discussion because you said, you know, this is uniquely Aspen and uniquely Pitkin County. And you asked about, you know, would they build somewhere else? Where would they build? And it's a little bit like the, what came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, I drove by the airport yesterday and it looked like there were three or 400 jets in the airport parking lot. <laughs> I don't think there's a lot of other places that are like that, but there's obviously people that come here for that. And I know that we're all not at that person and we're all not the same way. And I guess that's why when I started talking about Starwood, I said, you know, we have houses that are in the 3000 square foot range and we have houses that are in the 15,000 square foot range. Um, it just, it's, it's part and parcel from my perspective with what people are looking for with their Aspen experience. And part of that has to do with these very large houses. And I think that, uh, you know, Susan brought up acreage and view and, and Cindy mentioned mitigation, you know, from our perspective, that's one of the biggest things that we review for is how does this house potentially affect neighboring views and or neighboring properties? So um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that I have all of the answers. Um, I think there's a place for it. I very much understand and I'm looking at the numbers that the numbers go up when you go into these big houses. But, you know, we live in a free country where people are supposed to be able to do what they um, can afford to do as long as they do it within the laws. And, and uh, so I, it, it seems from, from talking to the residents in Starwood, they would very much like to be able to have the option to develop these larger houses. And, and the goal is not to fill up Starwood with a bunch of 15,000 square foot houses, but where appropriate, they can be built. Thanks. Suzanne? Um, the, the, the thing I keep coming back to is what we are charged with, and that is looking at growth, pacing, um, numbers of units, uh, placement, all of that through a climate change lens. And if we live up to that charge and you look at just this um, impact chart, if a 5750 square foot house is 77% larger than 3250 and it produces, but it uses 131% more than, than a 3250, that, that's remarkable. And if you look at um, a 10,750 square foot house being larger in square footage than 8250 by 231%, but its energy use is 520% more. And then if you skip on down to um, a, a 15,000 foot house being 362 square feet, percent square feet larger than a 1350, but, but wow but it uses 707.9%. That's, um, if we are going to look at this through a climate change lens, th those numbers as you go on up, I think are untenable because now we're not just dealing with it. And I, I understand, Mark, I think that your representation of Starwood, um, they will be proud of and you should be proud of. Um, however, I think that the time has probably passed when we only look at whether a house can be seen or not, whether a neighborhood will accept it or not. 
because now, I mean, we're, we're learning in a big way, both climate change and through the pandemic, that we are really all in this together. And so I don't see how we can possibly, how, how anyone could argue that houses of 15,000 square feet are serving us well, especially when we're on a committee looking through a climate change lens. I think if you put this in front of a, a fifth grader and said, what do you think about these impacts? Because we have to decide based on a climate change lens, what's good for us and what is not, that fifth grader would look at this and be astounded. And I, I don't think, I, I've always thought too, and I served on the County Planning and Zoning Commission for many years. And I could agree at that time with, you know, if we can't see it, then, and it doesn't produce too much traffic and it, all of those things, and a neighborhood will accept it, then I, I could see that that could go along. But I think now that's 15,000 square feet is outdated looking through a climate change lens. And um, I understand, I mean, I wouldn't wanna build it, but it doesn't matter whether I would want to, but other people do. However, it energy wise and climate change wise, it stands to harm all of us because you can't keep, um, the, the caucus boundaries don't include a plastic bubble that go over them so that they, take care of their own piece of climate change. We are all in this. So this is Mark. I'd just like to make a couple of quick points if it's all right. Um, you know, I, uh, Susan, I, Suzanne, I think you make very good points. I was also very involved with the round of discussions that Pitkin County was involved with prior to this, which was the rewriting of some issues with the energy code. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these numbers have to do with what we're looking at now and historically. And a lot of the talk with the energy discussions was making buildings much more energy efficient. And, you know, these numbers that we're looking at on these charts incorporate a lot of very inefficient buildings that were built in the late 60s up through today. And we really weren't even looking at energy efficiency in buildings until probably the 90s. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there is, there is way, there are ways that we can say you can build a 15,000 square foot house, but it can't have these energy efficiency numbers. That's my, my first point. Mm -hmm. uh, second point is that I, I think it, it's important for me to kind of say with Starwood, we have built out Starwood. So, you know, the growth potential for Starwood is rather small. Um, you know, there's no longer any vacant lots. They will continue probably to purchase houses and tear down the old ones and put up new ones. And you could tear down a 3,000 square foot house and put up a 15,000 square foot house. So there is development potential or the potential to develop large houses in that capacity. But for the most part, you're not going to see uh, a lot of further development in Starwood other than remodeling and um, putting additions on. But I do think it's important to dis have that discussion about energy efficiency with, with an eye towards, you know, new technology and how do we incorporate that new technology and how do we bring in renewable energy in order to work with existing buildings and going forward with all the buildings that are being built going forward. Thank you. So, may, I, um, may I add something? Um, yep, go ahead. I, okay, Mark, I think you had some, that's a very good point you made, making houses more efficient um, energy wise. Uh, I, I have to commend you all here that work for the city because I was thrilled when you actually went down. What? Oh, can you hear me? County, Pickin County. Not the city of Aspen. Um, we have city of Aspen reps here, but I just want to emphasize we are not talking about the city here. We're talking about the county. Okay. So thank, no. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But um, I appreciate you all. And the fact that I remember when you first came up with the 5750 square foot 
uh, max. I was thrilled with that because I personally don't like the huge homes, but I'd rather see a huge home on 50 acres than I would 50 homes on, you know, quarter acres or something. Uh, but uh, Mark had such a good point, and Suzanne, you did too. And keeping these things more energy efficient, that's, that's so important for the climate. And so I'm, I'm in agree, agreement with that. And when the, the county put on these restrictions to have just 5750, or else you might try to get a TDR, I thought that was a great idea. So I think you're all doing the right thing. So there. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, I just wanted to hop in real quick. And so one thing I wanted to address is, yes, Mark is entirely right. You can build a solar system. Um, if that house is completely electrified, you could theoretically build a solar um, renewable system on it that would counterbalance. To put that in perspective, though, um, this average load for a 15,000 square foot house on the solar system for that, just the panels, not any of the auxiliary equipment or anything like that would take up 2,700 square feet. Um, so that's, that, that's how many solar panels you would need to cover that energy load there. And then a 3,250, that one is about 330 square feet. So that's really that difference in that meeting offset. I do also wanna add that Starwood has been in discussions. I know they've been talking about it a while to build a, um, neighborhood solar farm to offset the entire. So there is, there are ways um, to address the energy use of house size. That's one of the reasons we wanted to give all of these other metrics as well, because one of the things that came out of that energy group was that, yes, climate action is important, but there's so many other impacts that come from the houses that need to be addressed as well. Um, and the one thing I don't have a column here because it's a very hard calculation to make, um, is the embodied energy. So that's the energy that goes into making that concrete, to cutting down those trees, to putting in the steel beams for all of the retention of the load of the house itself. And so concrete and steel are the two most energy intensive um, materials that you can use to build a house. And just from the nature of these houses, the larger the house, the more concrete and steel that goes in them. So you could also I don't know if I'd make the jump to say it's exponential or anything like that, but you could also make the argument there be a linear jump in the embodied energy going into those larger homes as well. I'd also like to just throw into the mix, thinking back on our discussion about um, benefits and prioritization. Um, I'm not sure, Zach, if we could even bring that up, um, but we had a chart that we created with, you know, what's really important as we have these discussions, um, our, you know, we sort of prioritized um, in that discussion the values and what was important. So it's another piece to think about as we look at climate action. But I, I, do, I mean, the whole question of how size, but climate action is definitely high on that priority list as we went forward. And Zach, I'm sorry to put you on the spot with that. I just think that. It was here. It was a body of work you've already done. And I just don't want to forget about it. Um, you know, we looked at, um, you know, our infrastructure and we looked at the environment and reducing the carbon footprint. Um, it was right up there. So um, as we're having this discussion, I'm kind of keeping tabs a little bit on what I'm hearing as, you know, what are the what are people saying about limitations? You know, have we come to that point? Um, and then I'm hearing where people are saying, hey, you know, there are some things that we feel you know, uh, moves that are mitigation, if you will, that, would, that might allow us to accept a larger home in the community. So I'm trying to keep tabs on those things as we, as we talk. Um, just a quick logistics thing, um, real quick for our colony, Susan. I know some people are having trouble raising their hand or any of that. Um, there's a chat function. If you indicate that you want to speak in the chat, I will also call on you. Um, Phi, thank you for being so patient. I know you've been waiting to um, add your comment here. So please feel free to jump in real quick before I go back to you, Suzanne. Great. Thanks, Zach. I just wanted to comment a little bit in reaction to something that Mark had said. And, um, and everyone that's speaking, I kind of have to second that it's really thoughtful and well thought about and 
Um, and thank you to the staff who are putting this on and being the thoughtful about the questions. But one of the things that Mark had said about Starwood was, well, if they can't build the 15,000 square foot here or even a 12,000 or whatever we, that size limit might be, they'll go someplace else. And these, these conversations are happening everywhere. So just be, you know, if Pitkin limits our size, limits the size of the ho ho homes, there's a very strong possibility, you know, tell your I'd will also and other communities will follow suit. And I think Pitkin County has always been a leader in these areas and in a way gives permission to other communities to take these really bold steps to support their values. Um, and you know, the county has declared a climate emergency. We have said that you know, climate action, climate reduction is, is a priority. Equity is a priority, obviously. You know, greenhouse gas and it, those impacts have a large impact on equity throughout, throughout our valley and the world. So um, I think we shouldn't be afraid of that. That's it. Suzanne, you had a comment you wanted to make? I, let me give my time to Joe. Right, Joe, please feel free to jump in. Um, Joe Wells. Um, historically, there's been an encouragement in the zoning code to, or the land use code to uh, encourage property owners to reduce their density. Um, in our case, in Castle Creek Valley Ranch, uh, we uh, reduced our density to less than 50% of that allowed in the AR-10 zone. It wasn't called AR-10 at the time, but uh, so uh, we did that in order to uh, obtain growth management allocations, uh, obviously. Uh, there are also two acre lots in uh, the Castle Creek Valley that were created before the implementation of zoning uh, I don't think it's reasonable personally to uh, lump all of the properties into the same basket in terms of uh, how much square footage is allowed. I, I, that just doesn't seem like a, a fair uh, approach. Uh, having uh, participated in, in the approvals for, for Castle Creek Valley Ranch where uh, we intentionally reduced the density uh, understanding that larger homes would be permitted in the area. So that's my two cents worth on that. Hey Joe, could I follow up really quickly and just say, are you, by saying that, are you advocating more of a floor area ratio throughout the county on the parcels that we just blanketly provide the 5750 exemption to today? Um, I'm not opposed to a floor area ratio. Um, if that's the approach that are you, are you we decided to. That not all lots are created equal because of their size. So not all lots should be able to build the same amount of square footage. I'm just trying to understand exactly what your bottom line is. No, I, I don't disagree with that approach. Uh, you know, I, I would, uh, that would be one way to, skin the cat, as they say. Okay, thank you. So I don't see anybody with their hand raised real quick. Um, I don't wanna say we're, we definitely need to still address these three questions. I think we've heard a lot on both sides of the argument, um, but I just really wanted to quickly wanted to address this fourth question. Um, so right now in the code, as, we, as we've mentioned before, you're exempt from the growth management system up to 5,750 square feet. So if you buy a lot, you can just build straight up to that. You don't have to go through the growth management system. You submit a planning application. It meets the code requirements. You submit for a building permit, you can build it. Um, as a result, this is essentially it's a way of us saying that this is the standard house size that we're okay with seeing. And as you've seen over the last 10 years with our data, people are starting to build closer and closer to this 5,750 square foot. The average house size was a little bit more than 5,100 for the last 10 years. 
Um, is this still the standard house size that we wish to see in the county? Do we want to see it smaller? Um, maybe we want to make it a little bit larger. I don't know which way you guys would like to go. I just, we've been addressing the top part. I'd like to address the bottom part a little bit as well. I, Susan, uh, I would certainly not want it to be any higher than the 5750. And if you go lower, that would be fine with me. And then they'd have to go through channels to, to do more than that. Suzanne? Um, I agree uh, with what Susan just said, um, that 5750, I'd like to see as the top unless then you go through a, a, a quota system, a, a competition or, but I'd like to see that encouraged. Um, I think the size of the house, what we've seen historically is that the size of the house tells us who, um, who will be added to our community. The people, are they, are they gonna be part-time residents or full-time residents? Now the pandemic is muddying that, whether, all the people who now own 15,000 square foot houses are going to move here and stay here remains to be seen, but we're certainly seeing that trending. Um, community balance has long been of interest to me. Um, the kinds of people who live here, and when I say the kinds of people, I mean workers, permanent, permanent local residents or people who, who come and go from Aspen. I think we, we recognized in, I don't know what master plan that was. Uh, Cindy, what was the first character-based master plan where we considered bal community balance? Yes, well, community balance was actually looked at when growth management was created in 1978, but the the master plan that really talked about character and community balance was the 1993 Aspen Area Community. That, that's the one I'm remembering. And um, I'd like to see us head back toward, toward the goals of that plan so that we can have more and more full-time permanent residents here who are people who who work in town and can live in town and can afford a smaller house and, and we provide places for that. You know, Suzanne, it's an interesting question that I've thought about too. I don't know that we've ever um, made a correlation between house size and occupancy. Occupancy has been, you know, has more recently become an, uh, an issue um, second homeowners versus full-time residents, um, but it, it would be an interesting, an interesting um, thing to look at. I get your overall concept that we should have families and people who live and work here who um, are typically full-time residents, and I don't know how that relates to smaller homes other than that smaller homes may be more affordable, right? It would but, be It'd be nice to know that because the people who are here full time are people who usually are very involved with the community, you know, with, with in all sorts of ways, you know, from Rotary to serving on the PNZ to working with uh, the Aspen Family Connection groups. And we just don't get that when people are, it, it, if, if, if the larger majority of people are going to be in 15,000 square foot homes and they're here only part-time, I think it erodes community and community building for us. Um, Marcella, I see you have your hand up. Please feel free to jump in. Marcella, we can't hear you. Okay, thanks. I, I, I was talking to myself apparently. Um, so you can hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, so I just wanted to throw in a, um, a no, another thought about the 5750, um, which, you know, as everybody knows, serves as a growth management exemption right now. 
I think it would be useful to look at maybe some opportunities around lowering that number, which would um, provide an opportunity for more use of TDRs. So if the exemption were say 3000 square feet, um, you, you might uh, get a higher market on the uh, TDR end. And then also, I think the pacing issue for me um, really should be looked at, at at building permit level instead of just pure uh, exemptions uh, through growth management. And that, that's it that I have for comments. And Marcel, if I could clarify your last comment so everyone can think about that. Um, you're, you're talking about rather than having just a certain amount of square footage that's available through growth management or a certain number of units through growth management, that actually the intake at the building permit phase would have limits. Um, so we may not actually allow more than five building new houses per year, you know, to actually be built through the building permit process, um, that that becomes more of the um, valve for pacing than um, relying on growth management for that. And, and I would have to agree with Marcella that growth management has never done a very good job of pacing um, because people in the past anyway have been able to come in at any time, there was no limitation um, when your growth management approval could be realized in terms of a building permit. You could wait 10 years, you could wait two years, but recently that did change to that you can um, you have to uh, submit a building permit within three years of uh, approval of a growth management application. So there's a little bit more on that, but. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know what that comment meant. Joe, I see your comment. Please feel to respond. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Suzanne's point about um, housing for local workers. Um, part of our employee housing commitment for Castle Creek Valley Ranch was to provide uh, what at the time was four deed restricted lots. One of those lots uh, over across the way went away uh, later, but uh, the three affordable housing lots were the first to be developed. Um, they have been owned since the mid nineties by the same three families. Um, there's never been a turnover. Um, I, think those are, are very valuable members of our community. However, the county has chosen to eliminate that option. Uh, that's no longer an option outside the UGB. So um, I happen to agree with Suzanne's point, but um, it's it's no longer a possibility under under the current code as I understand it. Thank you. Affordable housing has to meet, just like any housing, would have to meet the code requirements for underlying zoning. And um, it doesn't mean that a uh, planned unit development or another development couldn't look at incorporating and deed restricting uh, properties within their development. We just don't see it very often. And Joe, Joe, I muted myself. Okay, so how did you, how did you make that happen? Uh, was it the timing of it? And let me say that's very commendable. No, I I personally didn't make it happen. It, it was just part of our affordable housing proposal for our GMQS competition. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's been very successful in my, my opinion, but these smaller lots, you know, we rezoned those parcels to what was then called PMH, mm -hmm. uh, uh, AH, uh, but my understanding is you, you can no longer uh, apply for AH zoning outside, outside the UGB. 
Right, you don't have to rezone it, but you could, uh, development could restrict within it um, for affordable housing. Um, they wouldn't be rezoned and they would have associated with them the same amount of acreage that would be required in that zone district. Doesn't mean that they have to be larger lots, but the overall planned unit development or whatever would have to have accommodated for that in the overall acreage. But you're right, we no longer allow a rezoning to affordable housing in the rural areas. And some of that has to do with legal issues as well um, from a deed restriction perspective. Um, may, I, may I say something um, um, in regard to what Michella, Marcella said, uh, which I thought was great. Uh, one of the things that maybe we should, we should do, you all should do, is to decrease the 5750. Um, and the reason for that is that when my husband and I came here over 30 years ago, we did not want to build a large home. And, but the architects told us, then we shouldn't move to Aspen, which I thought was very rude. And um, they kept saying that you, you should build the maximum that was allowed. Now I'm just telling you how they presented this to us. And so we built, we were at Ute Place. So we built a home, it was just under 6,000 because that's what they recommended. Maybe if we all, you all decided to decrease the fact uh, that you didn't have to build as large a home, we certainly wouldn't have. We probably would have built less than 3,000. But, um, and they, the architects tend to do that. They'll say, if you wanna sell your home, you've got to, to build to the maximum. And, um, and I said, well, that seems ridiculous. Nobody's even living here, uh, hardly anybody. I was head of the homeowners association for almost the entire time because I was the only full-time resident, um, but we didn't want to do that. We felt like we had to because of what the architects push. So maybe uh, coming from the county here and the growth management, if, if someone wants to go to the extra expense to do it, to get a TDR, that might be a good way of keeping the, the um, square footage down. We have heard that, sorry, Mark. <laughs> now we have heard that, that um, you know, it's, it's more of the, like anyone, if you make an investment, you know, you wanna maximize your investment and that's kind of the game that's played here. And um, how do we encourage people to build what they want versus what they think they have to from an investment perspective? Really quickly, because um, we have two people on their phones um, and I can't make them a panelist just because of the nature of it. Um, I'm gonna like, give them an opportunity to talk. Um, if you don't wanna talk to you, you can just say no comment or whatever, right, real quick. Um, well, the number I was gonna pick on just left. Um, Jeffrey Woodruff, I'm gonna give you a chance to make a comment if you would like to, you're unmuted. Um, <clears throat> I just have one comment, which is, um, uh, I'm kind of in agreement with the reduction in, in um, growth management. I think the, the entire industry we're looking at is based on the price per square foot, is based on construction costs. So, you know, I think this is a difficult conversation in that architectural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structural, everyone's uh, charging based on a percentage, including the contractor, obviously, a percentage of construction. So, you know, the only what I'm hearing out of this conversation, the most logical piece is reduction in the in the growth management exemption would be a way to potentially reduce house size or at least um, um, you know fight back in an industry right now that's that's got a compensation structure that's based on the price per square foot. I don't see us in the short term moving um, to some sort of energy model or energy cost um, in that. I can't see an architect's compensation tomorrow changing so that designing a home that's net zero um, replaces the price per square foot or construction costs. So that's my stream of consciousness. 
Thanks, Jeffrey. And then I just saw that the number that ends with 1515 joined us again. I'm going to unmute you and you're able to comment now as well if you would like. Uh, uh, yes, it's Ellen Anderson. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yeah, I'm driving to Denver and I've been in and out. I've had to redial back in <laughs> six times. Um, I, I'm just going to withhold comments because it's been very hard to understand going through the mountains. I'm in Vail now. I'm headed to Denver. So thank you for asking me for my um, comments, but I'll hold off right now. It's just I just haven't been able to attend uh, in the way I would like to. So I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with you the next next week. Of course, have a safe drive. Careful. And then um, John Doyle, I've tried to promote you a couple times. I don't know if you were running away from me or not, um, but you're back as well. If, oh, and he left, so he is running away from me. <laughs> uh, you're muted. Yes, John, you can, uh, you, if you unmute yourself, John, yep, there you go. Uh, hello, all. So um, I wasn't able to write down all those, those questions you had so I could formulate some answers, but I'll do my best here. Um, I think a lot of you know that uh, I live in a cabin, so I'm used to living in a small space, and I think there are a lot of benefits to that, in, including just being easy on the planet. So that's where a lot of my answers are gonna come from. Um, answer to question number one, are 15,000 square foot homes okay? The short answer is no. Um, based on that chart you put up, Zach, the amount of waste generated is, you know, it's a strong word, but it's obscene. It, it's uh, that amount of waste. And, and what we're trying to stand for as a community, I think is, is very much at odds with that amount of waste and as Ellen pointed out, the amount of energy used to, to sustain these empty palaces throughout the year. Uh, number two, um, I think the uh, largest normal house size, I'm willing to compromise a little bit on that. I think I'd be comfortable with putting that at 6,000 square feet. Nice round number and uh, 6,000 square feet is a very large home. Um, and with Starwood, number three, with Starwood still allowing 15,000 square foot homes and the existing stock of, of large homes already built that I'm assuming if somebody bought them and they wanted their own place, they could scrape them and replace them with the same FAR. Um, I think that that's, there's a large stock of obscenely large homes already, you know, either existing or, uh, again, able to exist up in Starwood. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing the normal house size drop to say 4,500 square feet. Um, we could really send a message to other communities that we're serious about <clears throat> addressing climate change. And that's, that is 25% below my proposed maximum house size. And just in closing, I'd like to in my mind, the three things that have made Aspen what it is today, which is one of the most desirable places to visit or live in the whole world. Um, I think those three reasons are these. Number one, there was already a town here. So it had history and beautiful buildings, um, you know, a really beautiful foundation to start with. Number two, our distance from Denver um, helps us well, let's just say befall what has happened to uh, all the towns that are closer to Denver within you know, an hour or an hour, hour and a half driving distance. Um, we have a totally different experience here and I think the general public recognizes that. <clears throat> and the third and the most important reason that we have this beautiful place that we call home is zoning. And I'm gonna say down zoning sounds like a dirty word but uh, back in the, I'm gonna say late 60s with uh, Edwards and Shellman, when they started the downzoning process, it actually helped preserve what was so special about Aspen's character. 
um, although the byproduct of that was it simultaneously drove up real estate prices. So anyway, um, I think zoning is important. I think we do need to, as Cindy says, zone like we mean it. And I think we should be a leader in this. I mean, we're already recognized as being a leader in a, a lot of different areas. Why not tackle this head on? Because this climate crisis is real. Um, I want to thank uh, all you guys for putting this together and allowing uh, commoners to have a voice. Thank you. Thanks, John. You know, it's Cindy, Zach, it's Gail. I, I don't seem to have a hands up, but I just want to say ditto to the person before me. Um, Pitkin County has made itself an example of how to lead in community issues and climate issues. I have listened for the last five weeks. I don't, I haven't heard really any great examples of why we need to have 15,000 square foot houses, why we need to zone to the max, but there's every reason not to, including just the creation of garbage. We don't, we don't even have a place to sell off or give our garbage to anymore. And yet we allow these massive homes to be built. And they're, as soon as they change hands, they're redone, rebuilt. It's, there, there's no sense to it. This is the best community, as John points out, in the world. And we need to lead. I support you guys in leading a downsizing effort. Cindy? Yeah. Can I speak about something? I was going to say, just after John Doyle spoke, I was going to propose to him online here. Um, <laughs> but now I've decided that I also want to marry Gail, <laughs> uh, uh, probably more um, appropriately put. I, I want to say bravo to both of you. I agree with you fully. And I, I agree with John, I agree with your reasoning and I think it's smart. And I, I think you used the, the right words to describe um, things that are too large now for us. I think we've outgrown that. And, and Gail, thank you so much for all that you just said. I, I really appreciate both of your comments and I'm with you. Um, I, I, I'm Susan and I have to agree with, with John and Gail and Suzanne. <laughs> So just to sum up real quick, um, we're, we're by no means done yet, but I think we've heard some consensus on this fourth question that we believe the 5750 is a bit too large currently for what we'd like to see getting built, whether we, what that exactly that number is, um, the easiest is probably to take one TD off of it, which would take us to 3250 and that would create that extra competition for it. Um, I don't know if we have a consensus on what we think the smaller one should be or not, but I think we've heard that we would like to see the 5750 smaller. I think on this first one, we've heard both sides of it. I think we've heard some say that 15,000 square feet is okay. We've heard quite a few say that we believe it should be smaller. Um, I'd like to address this third question, which I think directly goes to Mark's comments. Um, these areas where we've already seen these larger homes go, so that'd be Starwood, that'd be Red Mountain, um, is uh, Owl Creek. Like, if we keep the larger house size, do we think that maybe there are some locations where they're okay to go still? I think it's dangerous to say that um, a certain area is okay because it might not be. And I think it should be um, addressed at the time that someone wants to put in such a large home. I'm not, when I said that I, I wasn't worried about 16. I didn't never said I wasn't worried about it, but there are places, I guess, that if someone wanted a 15,000 square foot house and, and it didn't affect, and it did, and I do like the fact of having uh, the new energy um, put in. I mean, you can now go a, a lot with having 
uh, great energy efficiency now. But um, I like the fact that, that we would take our square footage and no longer have it 5750 and bring that down for people such as myself who would not have wanted to build such a large house, but the architects keep pushing that all the time. And um, I don't know if you all hear that, but it's, it's, I think it's terrible <laughs> that they do that. So maybe, maybe we should uh, bring that down. As far as 15,000 square feet, that's, that is a huge home. And if it's on 50 or 100 acres <laughs> and it's out somewhere where no one, no one sees it or, or it doesn't affect and it's done efficiently, well, I, I think that should come up at that time and not just say Owl Creek is okay. You see what I'm getting at? individualize case by case. Um, exactly. So, jump in here with... Cindy, can I, can I chime in? Sorry, it's Michael. I, I was late to the conversation here. I just want to add uh, to maybe what Susan said, you know, going back two slides, uh, you know, that job generation column, I think is, you know, it, it doesn't really care where the house is and, and that that job generation has ripple effects through housing, through uh, competition against other economic sectors that we want to remain viable, um, and the vehicle trips as well. That that you know, I think to me, those are the two columns I look at, and, and waste too, of course, and, and energies. All of them are super relevant, um, but they that that like doesn't matter unless unless you're going to insist that the big house is built on transit and that that number of jobs in the vehicle are going to somehow be mitigated by its location i don't think it really matters where you build it it's going to come with with those really consequential impacts cindy one more comment from me gail um and joe um i i don't i don't know where your house is so please don't take offense to this comment but anyone driving out Castle Creek Road, if they wanna see examples of really unusually large homes not mitigated in any community sense, that's a good drive to take. I mean, huge 15,000 square foot homes that are literally blights on the, on the landscaping. And I'm afraid that's what you, once you open up to that kind of housing size, that's what you get. I mean, yes, some of them up in Starwood are pretty well hidden, but Castle Creek, which is a, a, a community resource of wilderness, has been permanently scarred by those homes. You guys, can I say something? Please. Sure. Um, I mean, maybe this is a dumb idea, but why can't we eliminate the county TDR program so that you can't keep adding on 2,500 square feet and you can buy, you know, one or two or three, I think sometimes. And I know that we think that's making it so that people aren't developing in other areas, but you know, I, don't, I just don't know if it's a great program anymore. That's the debate. Thank you, Kim, that was not dumb. I mean, it's the question we have right now. And I see that Meg unfortunately can't be here right now, but she um, represents Starwood as well. And um, she's gonna write her comments in, um, and get those to us and we'll post them. I saw that on her chat here, but um, there, are, there are different opinions about that. Um, if you look back at some of the data, if you guys have a chance to go back to some of the original data that we provided um, in the 2019 summary of our growth management program, it's about a third, a third, a third. So um, in the rural and remote area, about a third of the people have chosen not to take development rights away from the land 
some of which have been developed into cabins of a thousand square foot limitation. About a third have been sold off of the land, preserving that land and building larger homes throughout Pitkin County. They've been landed with that square footage. And about a third have been, the rights have been taken off of the land, but those are still floating out there as rights that could be purchased. I think there's about 135 that have been severed from the land but have not been purchased yet or landed in um, on a certain piece of property. So the Board of County Commissioners is gonna to have to look at that program and the equity involved in that program. Um, and we're also gonna to have to look at the goals uh, to be achieved or not achieved in that program to date. Um, so how much land has been preserved? Are we okay? <clears throat> is it time to sunset the TDR program? Those are all real questions for today's discussion. So not a dumb question at all. And then Kim, if, if square footage were not limited beyond what we have today, that would force everybody into the growth management competition um, to get up to a larger square footage. So we'd have a more robust competition. <clears throat> um, that would be the effect of that if, if that was the only thing we did. If we got rid of the TDR program, uh, people would be forced under today's rules to compete for that square footage. And there'd be a more robust competition, which is something that the Planning and Zoning Commission has thought was important moving forward. And as an alternative to, to resulting in a more robust growth management competition, we could just use our zoning regulations to set a max house size and say, you know, that's it. There is no growth. There's no ability to go larger. You just zone it like you mean it, as someone um, quoted Cindy as saying. Yeah. I No, not a dumb question, but Kim, may I clarify with you? Are you just saying that the TDR program um, may be resulting in larger homes that we don't want to see and people should go into growth management or are you just, or are yeah. you? Yeah, I just think it is. It's creating an ability to. Did somebody just say something? Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just thinking that, you know, are we just creating. I mean, where would people really you be adding that square footage to those existing homes? Or are we just creating a money maker? Well, for the housing program, but also just to, for people to go crazy because they can buy it. I, I don't know. Good questions. Uh, Leslie, I think you said you wanted to add a comment to this. Yeah, I'm really interested in this um, aspect of using TDRs for additional square footage versus utilizing growth management for additional square footage. My experience so far without looking at changing the GMQS and making a more robust system, which I know is the charge, one of the charges here is GMQS, um, the system today works very well when someone is subdividing the property, creating greater density, the scoring, the aspects that one uh, can achieve more scores on works very well for subdivision and increasing a level of density. There's bonuses if someone reduces the amount of density that they could add to the property. There's bonuses for reducing the allowable square footage that you, that you could build on the property. However, when you look at GMQS, when, which is available today to add square footage to an existing home, it's very easy to do. Our scoring system doesn't, doesn't really get at um, benefits that could be achieved because it's very difficult to do that if you wanna add 2000 square feet um, 
to your home in, and I'll just pull a recent example, which was in Starwood. The county's not really getting anything out of that for that additional square footage. There's really no benefits that the county is achieving or the community is achieving from that. However, if one could not avail the GMQS system and could only purchase TDRs for those additional, that additional square feet, then we are, we, we're taking a development right out of the backcountry. And I see, the, I see the benefit in utilizing TDRs really outweighs the ability to use GMQS. So I would really encourage a committee to think about eliminating GMQS altogether for additional square footage. And then as you all have talked about, reducing the size and then enabling one to go above kind of a cap for TDRs, just we're, just, we're pulling more out of the back country, a development right out of the back country by doing that. Thank you. Thanks, Les. The one thing that um, we have to do is really think about the, um, the legal provisions on that and whether or not options have to be available um, rather than just telling someone that they have to buy this privilege through the two years. But we'll, we'll continue to work with our attorneys on that question because it, it's, um, it's, it's definitely an approach that you know, What time are we getting? Let me look at this. Okay, we got a little bit more time. So there's a the question back up real quick. If anybody has any comments, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, any more comments? I'd like to take comments for about another 10 minutes and then I'd like to wrap it up with uh, my head in our next meeting. So, thanks. You have a question so far. Dan? Zachary, uh, your comments a little while ago had to do with what the consensus that you see evolving and having to do with smaller um, homes. But, and so if, if that consensus is evolving now, then I think that question number three about where larger homes are okay is irrelevant for this moment. Well, so the consensus I'd heard was definitely on number four. Um, the 15,000, um, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that we, we have heard some dissenting voices on the 15,000. Uh, we've heard property rights. We've heard uh, Mark from Starwood saying that he feels that those areas are justified. Um, we've heard people comment saying that if the property is suitable, if it's a 500 acre property where no one can see it, it's suitable. Um, so I, I don't know if I've exactly heard a consensus on one. Um, we've heard a lot of differing opinions on it. Um, I definitely heard one on four that the 5750 as the standard house size is too large. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that was what I was trying to get at. Um, and, and again, the, with, the, with the number two is, I mean, maybe we do still allow larger homes, but you could put it at 8250. You could put it at 10,000. There's, there's a lot of, range there for what that large house size could be. And so I, I think we've had extensive discussion on one, we've touched on three, I think we have a consensus on four. I'm not sure I've heard um, too many, rec we've heard a recommendation for 6,000 from John. Um, I don't know if I've heard anybody else suggest what the largest house size in Picking County should be. I. I don't think it should be 15,000 square feet. I think that is far too big, especially with us looking at this through a climate lens and, and with the impact tables that you have shown us. Well, Do you have a suggestion of what you think it should be? I think six is good. Is there anyone else who would like to weigh in on um, you know, that number or a range for that number? Of the I just... I would. This is Mona Newton. I think you should keep it at the 5750 
because we just went up, right? you have some REMP requirements, renewable energy mitigation programs, and that triggers that. You just went through this process with the building code. And so I think rather just leaving it where it is now, just kind of keeps that consistency. So, you mean as the maximum home size or as the growth management exemption? Well, <laughs> actually, maybe he was just saying the maximum, yeah. would be and that's what John Dole had said. So that's that's the clarification I'm seeking. Yeah, um, I think the growth management exception, and then uh, you might do something like we have done with the um, the building code that in two or three years, that's your house size. Uh, maximum so that you know you can't get through that maybe and maybe you step it down here's an idea that just popped into my head if right now 15,000 is the is the um and I know this might be like the rush to build like I better get my 10,000 square foot house built now because in five years I'm not or in three years I'm not going to be able to build anything larger than 5750 but maybe there's a step down so your growth management exception remains at 5750 and then your house size your house size manage or house size maximum is 75 and that gets stepped down over the next two years that's that might be an option but 5750 might also be your um maximum too with and that just kind of gets you there without having to think about it more but i have a feeling that that there's going to be a lot of pushback for that but i'm trying to also listen to what suzanne is saying and agree with her about the um climate action that we're trying to move keep moving forward so you're still a little you're still kind of i, know, I was all over the board right I know, because it's, cool. it's hard. So I think your 5750 year, year starting for your growth um, exception. Yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's great to just hear everybody's thought process as well. And is there anyone else who's raised their hand, Zach? Marcella, do you have your hand up or did, uh, you, is it just been up? I, I do have it up. Excellent, go ahead, please. Okay, so... Um, I'm in the Maroon Creek Caucus area, and as um, I think Cindy or Ellen described earlier, we actually did um, downzone ourselves to 5750. So in our area, that is a house size cap now. Um, I, I suggest that you, um, it, so obviously we think that that's the appropriate amount, but um, I think the growth management exemption piece of this is really important. So I would definitely, definitely support uh, lowering the exemption amount so you can have an extra uh, TDR market. And do you have a, a size in mind? Maybe 3,000 square feet. And, you know, I don't know how the math works. And, you know, you might need to tweak the, the, the way the TDRs uh, work. But, you know, you, you would create an instant market. Right. Okay. So you, I'm sorry, I kind of missed it. Did you say three? As many yes. As many? Thank you. Anybody else has a comment? Please feel free to just unmute yourself and jump in. No, it's Joe Wells again. Um, I just wanted to follow up on. Um, Liz's comment um, about the TDR program. I think um, I think it's been tremendously successful. I can't imagine uh, the alternative of having residences on all those discrete mining claims up in the rural and remote areas. So uh, I certainly wouldn't want to see the program el eliminated. Uh, secondly, to the caller who commented about the homes in Castle Creek. I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, the offensive homes are not in Castle Creek Valley Ranch and predate the adoption of the scenic corridor uh, provisions for our area. Um, those homes, I'm thinking of two in particular that could be screened a lot better than they are presently. And, um, uh, 
just jump right right off the site at you as you drive by. So uh, I hope the scenic corridor rules will be applied vigorously in our area. Thank you. Um, John, I saw you briefly unmuted yourself. If you'd like to comment, you are a bit, uh, able to. Um, yeah, I just had one question. Uh, so currently, it's my understanding that with the TUDR program, they take the right to build a thousand square feet in rural and remote, and that allows somebody to build 2,500 square feet in the, on the valley floor. Yeah. Um, is that, that how, that's how it works? Plus the 35 acres rural remote. Right. Um, so what about this? What if it, it was just an even trade or, or something less than 2,500 square feet? What if it was, uh, you exchange your 1,000 square feet of right to build in rural and remote for 1,000 square feet on the valley floor? Wouldn't, wouldn't that, uh, I don't know, would definitely drive the market up for TDRs probably, but it would limit the amount, uh, might help limit house size be a bit of a deterrent. Well, it's not always the thousand square feet rule and remote. A lot of times it's the right to build 2,500 just somewhere else in the county for someone else to build 2,500. It's, it is usually apples to apples. So Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe you can also be awarded a TDR if you rezone 35 acres or more to rural remote, which takes away that development, right? Is that correct? It depends on where you are. Um, there's a provision in the code and it doesn't necessarily have to be 35 acres. Um, if your land um, has rural and remote characteristics and values that we wanna preserve, it doesn't have to be the 35 acres um so that is there as well but kind of going back to john and kim you know the program was set up to try to incentivize we we zoned it like we meant it we didn't want to see cabins larger than the thousand square feet in the rural and remote areas because for a lot of reasons it was the scenic it was also the infrastructure and it was also um you know, more the seasonal nature of those homes and keeping them smaller. Um, and the environment at that altitude. Yeah, and, and the, the high alpine environment and the altitude. But the, um, but the trade-off was thought that there had to be more of an incentive rather than seeing, we, you know, the incentive was you would get more value if you sold your right, therefore preserving the land, which was mostly the goal in the rural and remote area. So the idea was that you would get more from the, um, from the sale. And so there was the incentive to sell it for more square footage or for a development right elsewhere in the urban growth boundary. So that was the theory behind that, John. Um, our, economy and our market is so wacky that it may just work to have it one-to-one. -one. Um, don't know. I mean, definitely, definitely a good idea, something that for us to throw in the hopper and think about as we go through all this. Um, hopefully that made sense. Did that make sense, Kim? Well, it's just not always rural and remote that signed the TDRs. So I'm a little confused as to. You mean from where the TDRs come from? Right. Right. And that's what Zach just said. Um, right. Correct. Sometimes to preserve a historic structure, you can um, get a TDR off of that or some of these other properties that are um, seen to have um, you know, other values, the rural and remote values that can, can request a rezoning. So, correct. So, Cindy, you asked for the last 10 minutes. Um, we just passed that mark a little bit. Um, okay. I just want to let everybody know that this is an open conversation. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to it in later discussions, but if you have 
an epiphany mo moment in between these meetings, please feel free to jot it down and send it in to us. And we'll make sure that if you want it to be shared with the group, we'll share it with the group. Um, and with that, Cindy, it's all yours. Well, thanks. Um, if there's no, is, is there anybody that's just dying to say something? Because if you are, I'll give you three of my minutes. No? Okay. So um, what I wanted to do was kind of summarize where I think we are. This was a great conversation and thank you all for your, um, for your comments and all the different angles on this really important topic as we go into um, crafting the new growth management, if you will, and recommendations. I think we're at a point where Helen and Zach and I can step away and maybe um, provide some scenarios based on all the six, the six different meetings that we've had where we've talked about benefits, where we've talked about prioritization as far as values are concerned. We've talked about obviously square footage. We've talked about TDRs to a certain extent. We've talked about those exemptions of, of growth management and what they are today and what values they may or may not hold any longer. Um, and we've talked about uh, potentially trying to make the scoring system more robust. So with all of that, we've talked about maximum house size, we've talked about um, uh, looking at mitigation versus um, limitations. Looking at all those different variables that we've looked at, I think we need to kind of push away and bring you, as we go into these last three meetings, um, some scenarios to kind of bat around and see if, as we did in the last public outreach where we looked at energy and land use code requirements for, um, for energy use, I think we ought to back away and bring you some scenarios and, and let you chew on them, let you um, think about those and see what your reactions might be to those. Um, does that sound like a good approach? Is everybody um, comfortable with us developing some scenarios? And doesn't mean that we have to do it all. If you have a scenario that you think is a good one moving forward, given all of the different components of growth management that we've talked about, please submit that. I mean, I heard the makings of some today. And so some people might be sitting there jotting down things just like I am, and you might have a scenario in mind that you want to offer up to the group to consider. But I know, given what I've heard today and in the past six meetings, five meetings, um, I would be able to come up with a handful of scenarios that we can at least shoot at that have different ranges involved. So um, does that sound like a good approach to everybody in our last six minutes? It does to me. It sounds like a very it sounds like a very good approach to me, and um, of course we can't anticipate how broad those will be. But the sooner we could get them, so we'd have time to look at them at home instead of on the fly in the meeting, that'd be great. Okay, Ellen and Zach, go for it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, uh, yeah, we'll do our best. We. We really always do want to get out our agenda to you earlier. We're sorry about this week. We just had, Zach had a lot on his plate and was doing some, he was obviously our number cruncher. So um, thank you. We'll try to get it out by what, Tuesday, Zach? Yeah, we'll, we'll shoot for Tuesday. Um, yeah, that works. I would personally just like to say thank you to all of you for coming this morning. Um, this is normally a pretty contentious discussion and I think you all were very polite and you handled it very well and I just want to say thank you for giving that respect to the conversation but also to your fellow participants and I think it was very productive so thank you. And also just thank you for persevering and, and hanging in there with us we really need your help and we recognize how much time and energy and effort it takes 
uh, out of your normal day <clears throat> to, um, to participate. So yeah, thank you, thank you, you're much appreciated. Yeah, sincere thank you. And just one more, um, for those of you who weren't able to talk today or might have further thoughts or who might be new to the conversation and have questions, please let us know, give us your uh, questions, um, call us um, if you need more clarification or email us and um, Meg, if you're back on the line, please get us what you have in writing so we can share it with the entire group. Um, or we can pick up on it again next week, but I think, I think we're ready to draft up some scenarios for you guys to shoot at. So. I have one last question. Uh, are, I don't see when we're in session comments or even the presence of say um, land use consultants in the private sector or the real estate community or are you all hearing from them outside of these meetings? Not much. Um, I did make an effort to call. Um, there, were, there were a group of land use attorneys and um, con land use consultants who had been concerned about some of our quick fix changes to growth management back in April and May. And they had written a letter to the, <coughs> to the Board of County Commissioners uh, concerned about the process and being um, held virtually and also being um, held during the pandemic and concerns about that. And um, some people reached out about concerns that we were doing the um, meetings during the day. And we realized this is such a busy time for everyone in the pandemic with real estate, with um, uh, land use attorneys and also with land use planners. It's a really busy time for them, but um, we have everything recorded. We have everything um, on the website and we do make efforts. I have reached out personally to several of the people on that list and um, people have said that they are going to attempt to be here when they can and they may or may not have sent some representatives, people I don't really uh, know that I see here today. I'm hoping they are representatives and that they can um, help get the word out that we're seeking those comments. So um, we really trying to do the best we can to get that input. Um, thanks for the question because I like to make that public record because we don't want to be at the very end of the nine weeks and, and hear all of those concerns where people didn't show up. Um, all we can do is take the comments that come in and um, try to filter those into our um, recommendations to the board. Um, so trying the best we can. If there are other people on this call that can reach out um, more, please do. Um, I did hear about, um, I'm not a big Facebooker, but I heard that there was some discussion on Facebook and there was some concern. I think Michael, you were part of all that. I don't know if Michael's still here, Michael Miracle, but the whole concern that, you know, we're a little under the radar and um, trying the best we can. So uh, please spread the word. Um, we are having good participation. There's over 25 people consistently showing up. Um, and those 25 people, we really value your comments and like Ellen and Zach said, your commitment to really getting to know this um, detail and helping us make informed recommendations to the board. So thank you very much. And then Gail had a comment in the chat that said both she and Kim are part of the real estate community. And I believe John Doyle had a comment he wanted to make quickly. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, it's, I'm feeling really good about participating in this. Uh, I look forward to the next three meetings. Um, when I first saw the roster that went out to everybody who was who volunteered to participate, I got to say, I was a little disappointed because it's the roster seemed to be stacked with architects, planners, realtors, and developers. And I guess they must be doing busy doing all those things because I haven't seen a whole lot of them show up here. 
at any rate, um, thanks for putting in all your time and thanks for, uh, I thought, you know, the outreach telling, talking about being part of this was actually pretty well done. I saw it in the newspaper several times before. And then I, I think I got an email before which prodded me to sign up. So nobody, I don't think anybody can complain that they didn't know it wasn't going, that it was going on. Anyway, thanks, uh, see you next week. Thanks, John. Yeah, we send out this email to about 100 people every week. Um, so hopefully they're not, we're just not in their spam. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks everybody.